Give me the slides, by the way. Okay, so you can, uh, let me just pull it up. Was it in the prep? Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's here. Okay. Is this like the slide that you open? No. no, no, I opened the link from the slide. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Deva Manu, and now we'll move on to uh, learning a bit about the functional nature of conv convolutional neural networks. We'll try to understand uh, why this network is used and why is it successful on uh, image processing tasks. Uh, so if you remember from last class, uh, we were talking about uh, fully connected layers. Now, what was happening in those networks was given an input image. We were rolling the in, unrolling the input, input image into a single vector. So suppose your uh, input image was m by n pixels. And if it's a color, color, colored image, then you will have three particular channels, red, green, and blue. So we were unrolling everything out into a single vector. Uh, in this slide, we can assume that to be a total of three, 3072 pixels. And then we were linearly transforming it with a weight matrix and then trying to predict some classes based on we were basically trying to predict a probability density over the classes so for that we we were using a weight matrix of uh, number of classes times the number of total pixels and a simple dot product was giving us the output now the problem in this particular network is that we were not uh, keeping the spatial structure of the image intact uh, so an image is meaningful to us when it's in it's in structure. If it's unrolled into a single uh, vector, it doesn't make any sense, and it wouldn't make any sense to the network also. So that's why these networks have limitations in terms of getting very good results. So the idea was to keep the structure intact and do processing on that particular structure itself. So uh, uh, as 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 we saw in 1998, uh, the LENET uh, by uh, Professor Lan, Jan Lacun, uh, he proposed the convolutional neural network. And as, as I said, the uh, significant, uh, significant point here was that it, it maintains the spatial structure of the input image. So in this uh, particular image, we can see an uh, uh, image of uh, width 32 pixels and height 32 pixels and having a depth of three channels. So this is particularly an input of a three-dimensional three input of 32 by 32 by 3. What we do in a convolutional, uh, the basic function of a convolutional layer is previously in, in the uh, fully connected layer, we had a weight matrix of W. Now we'll have smaller weights called filters. Uh, point to note is these weights are sometimes called filters, sometimes called kernels. Uh, so what we do is we take a filter and then we slide it over the image 
and in every instance when it's upon a particular part of the image convolution operation what is a convolution operation uh, so uh, convolution is basically a term which is uh, very frequently used in uh, signal processing domain uh, so basically when you have two signals and you want to mix those signals in some way uh, one of the signals plays the role of the signal and the other plays the role of a filter or a kernel and then a convolution operation is applied over there uh, the uh, equation of which we'll see later and then it somehow mi mixes the image we are trying to do something similar here what we do is we take this filter and overlay it over a chunk of the image of the same size as the filter and we do for every weight of the filter we do a element wise uh, multiplication and add it up so basically it's kind of a dot product um, now the important thing to note is which uh, uh, is is this that whenever we are using a filter it will always have the depth of the image that it's acting upon so if our image is having three channels rgb then our filter will also have a depth of three channels the width and the height will be uh, generally smaller uh, and uh, as you can see here it will be overlaid on the image itself now uh, in this slide you can see that it is kind of overlaying in the center of the image so the filter is now concentrating on that particular chunk which is of height and width 5 by 5 across the depth of the image which is 3 now when it is focusing on that particular region for every weight uh, value in the filter it will do a product uh, over the corresponding pixel in the image and then sum it up so this can be mathematically represented as the equation we can see here uh, here w is basically the uh, filter which is unrolled into a column vector and x is the corresponding chunk of the image on which the w is concentrating or overlaying and unrolling it into a particular uh, particular column vector uh, of the Im image and then we just uh, do the transpose so that the math works out fine and this is basically equal equivalent to speaking that uh, we are taking element wise multi multiplications of the pixel and the kernel or the filter and then summing it up now whenever a filter is on a part of the image everything will be added up and this will contribute to a single neuron in the next layer so as you can ima imagine uh, uh, this thing uh, the filter slides over the image in a grid fashion so it'll probably start in the top left corner and then slide through the row and then come back to the left corner for, for uh, with a vertical uh, stride and then do the same thing again across the row so it, it goes into a grid fashion and for every particular instance it will get one one uh, neuron output so uh, if it suppose uh, say uh, strides x times over the image so it will create x neuron outputs a single filter and as i said before every time it's on the image it it works upon the overall depth of the image uh, and also while doing this operation we add a bias term uh, now the uh, thing is that whenever it strides over the image the weights are same so the filter is same and the same filter is going over the image so as you can see here when this filter went over the overall image strided over in a grid fashion it created different neurons and all these neurons together will be called an activation map so when this particular filter of size 5 by 5 by 3 went over the image of 32 by 32 by 3 it resulted in one activation map of it's kind of a plate of neurons and naturally the depth will be one because it's just one neuron at a time now coming back to the convolution uh, operation i mean it's it's uh, in uh, the intuition comes not just from signal processing but there are different fields where we can relate this up to and that's why in the slack group i had shared some of the links uh, so i'll try to go over one of them this is a blog uh, uh, where uh, convolution has been very well explained and as you can see the overall uh, 
intuition of using a convolution. Why is it called a filter in the first place? This is because when the operation is applied, the filter or the weight tries to filter out what is required for that particular task and tries to throw away the noise with respect to the task that we're doing. So if you're trying to, in this example, we are trying to identify dresses. So there's no point keeping information which is not the dress and the background. So the filter here learns to filter out the shape of the dress and throw everything out. So since it does this, since it throws out the uh, noise, it's kind of filtering process. And that's why it's called a filter. But why does the convolution operation help in doing this? So this has its uh, relation with, I mean, if you go by the maths, then it has relations with how Fourier transforms work. So basically, I won't go much into details because uh, you can go through the blog later. What it does is basically the convolution operator of two functions is equivalent to the dot product of every pixel when the picture itself is in the frequency domain. So a picture is normally in the pixel time space domain. We convert that into the frequency domain using a fast Fourier transform. And then we do the element wise product. And then we get a single value and do the inverse uh, Fourier transform to get the resulting picture back. Uh, when we convert this into the frequency domain, uh, the representation is basically, if you can see here, uh, the white box represent the uh, frequency terms. So as, as explained in the blog, uh, the centered central terms have low frequency terms, and the terms in the out, uh, towards the edges have high frequency terms. So suppose uh, you use a filter of something like this, which allows activation uh, of only the central part. So only the lesser frequency terms remain, and the higher frequency terms are filtered out. Then once you do this operation and do the inverse tra Fourier transform, what you get is a blurred image. So this is kind of a difficult thing to uh, understand because it's mathematical. Uh, a simpler example would be, suppose there is an image and we are using a filter whose weights we have fixed. Uh, suppose what we are asking the filter to do, or we are forcing the filter to do, is take a particular pixel on which it is overlaying and take the difference with its neighbors. So what will happen if in the original image itself, there was an edge, so the central the, uh, there will be stark difference between the intensities between, uh, on the edge and right beside the edge. So when you take a difference of these pixels, it will become a high value. But if the uh, patch in the original image is not an edge, it's a flat surface, then the nearby uh, neighboring pixels will have similar values. So if you take a difference, it will be near to zero. So if the filter is doing that, what we'll get as a result is an edge detector. In another example, if we take a filter which is uh, having, suppose the filter has evenly distributed weights, then what it basically does is trying to take an average of the input pixels into one particular neuron. If you look conversely, what will happen is every neuron in the original picture will diffuse a little bit towards its neighbors. So it ends up getting a blurry image. So this was what people used to do before deep learning. Uh, when people used to work on image processing, they used to design this uh, kernels or filters by hand. They used to experiment different kinds of weights and used to design these filters and then get the output image. The whole point of using deep learning is to learn from data. And when we learn these uh, filters, the initial weights are random. But as the data is seen and as the machine understands the task to be performed, it learns the type of uh, weights that the filter needs to be to extract out, extract out in, uh, important information. So whether it needs to be an edge detector, whether it needs to blur the image, whether it's, it needs to give a high contrast. So it, the machine basically learns those filters. That's why uh, when we do back propagation on a convolution neural network, all we are trying to do is learn the weights of the filters so that they can act as certain preferred filters. Uh, there are different uh, interpretations from different domains, like fluid mechanics. So uh, if suppose uh, there are two liquids which have uh, different concentrations. So when you mix those liquids, they'll have different diffusion rates at different places. So th where there is a higher difference between the concentrations, there'll be more diffusion rates and lesser elsewhere. So uh, you can think of similar things with the image. So when the filter is focusing on a particular area, 
if there is an edge so there's a kind of a, a, a large difference between the concentrations so those will be focused more when the filter operates on it and then uh, get the resulted activation map uh, another term that we all might hear uh, is the convolution is equal to cross correlation correlation so this comes from probability theory so this is a good example here where if you take a image of a person and just extract out the face, uh, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth into this uh, thing called kernel, and then take the inverted uh, kernel uh, and then slide it over the image. So, and if you, and every time if you do a convolution operation, just like a convolutional neural network does on the input image, uh, you'll see that of course when this kernel is over here, it has lesser correlation, but when it it is over here it ends up getting higher correlation because this is the face and this is the filtering of a face. So you can see the frequency here, I mean the activation that a white dot here appears when the kernel is over this particular. Uh, so these are some of the intuitive uh, interpretations of why a convolution is applied. But what we need to take away from this whole thing is we need to understand that when a filter is applied across the image, it creates one layer activation map and uh, the filter ac uh, acts upon the whole depth of the image. Now, uh, as I said, that filter can learn to be edge detector or make the image blurry or different things. But when it comes to large data, we don't know what is needed. That's the whole point of not using handcrafted features. So we don't want to explicitly say that we want edge detectors or something. So what we do is we give space to the whole network to do its own understanding. So we allow different amounts of filters to be present so that each filter can be trained and become uh, a feature detector of its own kind. So we do not just limit ourselves to a single filter, but we have multiple filters in every layer. So each filter will contribute in creating an activation map. So suppose if on this input image we had six filters then our activation map will have six activations activation map which is which, which will be part of our next layer and uh, this will again now become a new input image for the forthcoming layer so the new input image will be 28 by 28 and having a depth of six earlier we had three but we convoluted with six filters to get six activation maps uh, how the 32 by 32 became 28 by 28 depends on how we take the uh, strides of the filters, which we'll see later in the uh, lecture. Uh, so the idea is to basically stack it up. I mean, uh, from his history, we can see what uh, Hubel and uh, in, the, in the previous works, we can see that uh, the images in the cortex of the cat, uh, uh, they had a hierarchical structure, a topographical thing where uh, there was sim simple uh, simple cells which were identifying simple things and then as the hierarchy went on it was trying to identify um, complex things so we apply the same thing over here what we do is we stack up all these convolution operations so in this is the input image we'll have uh, can some, someone tell me how many filters we'll have here to get this output image Six, yes. Uh, so every filter will create a 28 by 28 by one, and we'll have six different filters. And mind you, all the filters will have separate weights. Um, and uh, we'll get an image of 28 by 28 by six. And then here we'll have around, uh, we'll have 10 filters, which will, each filter will be maybe five by five or three by three or seven by seven and having a depth of six. And it will contribute to creating a activation map of 24 by 24. And if we have 10 of such filters, we'll get a 24 by 24 by 10. So this thing goes on and uh, just like the intuition in uh, simple neural networks, we pass it through a nonlinear activation to make it an overall nonlinear operation and not just a stacking of linear operations. Uh, so, uh, uh, Number of filters, size of filters, depth of the network, all these are hyperparameters. Uh, but 
because this is a topic where people have explicitly worked a lot upon. So there are some uh, design choices that people are biased towards. Uh, so in practice, people sometimes uh, mostly take filters of size three or five or seven. We don't want the filters to be very big because it won't be able to focus on what's on the image. Uh, if the image has very fine uh, structures, maybe the photo a photo was taken where the person is very standing at a very distance uh, with respect to the frame. So the person will be very small in the image. And if we force our filter to be very large, it won't be able to detect those simple things like simple facial uh, cuts or facial uh, edges. That's why we tend to take smaller filters. And the important thing to note is, as we move on to deeper levels, the, fil the reception area of the filter in increases. So if the filter here of size 3, suppose, concentrating on 3 by 3 patch, but a filter of size 3 over here in the third layer, say, it won't be focusing on 3 by 3 with respect to the original image. With respect to this image, it will be 3 by 3. But with respect to original image, it will be covering a much more wider reception area. And as we stack up these images and as we one layer after the layer, it is uh, we assume that fi the final convolution will have receptors or uh, we will have filters which have reception area of the whole image. So when it has reception area of just part small patches, it tries to identify things from those patches. As we move deeper, it tries to those findings and then group them up and try to understand what is there in the overall image. So the reception area increases. But as I said, the, the depth of the uh, uh, layers is a hyperparameter. And the number of filters also is a hyperparameter. So how many filters per layer we need to we want to take? So most of the, if you see uh, the popular uh, architectures like AlexNet or VGGNet or uh, whatever, uh, they'll have different um, amounts of depth. So, and if you take the example of residual networks, so it has a huge depth of around 150, which is normally taken, or you can even increase it up to thousands. Uh, on the computing power that you have. Uh, so yeah, it's a hyperparameter choice, which people design on their own. But now nowadays, we have new work. So this is an emerging domain where we are trying to uh, come up with solutions which give us these numbers uh, for good performance. So we are using reinforcement learning, or we are using hyper networks, which are auxiliary networks, which are trying to predict uh, the architecture of our network so that it performs the best. So it'll try to predict how many layers we need to have, how, how many filters we need to have. So those are uh, uh, networks which try to predict the architecture of the image. Oh, sorry, architecture of the network. Um, over here, we can uh, see some visualizations for different layers of uh, the CNN. The input is, as you can see, a dog. And assuming we have three convolutional stacked layers, and then finally, a fully connected linear separable classifier. So if you, if you see here uh, in the low level features, uh, what you will notice is the network is trying to identify very simple constructs like edges. So if you focus on most of the uh, act, uh, most of the feature act, uh, visualizations, you'll see small edges that it's it's trying to filter out, identify small edges. When you move to mid-level features, maybe it is uh, one thing that we should know is as we move deeper into the network, it becomes humanly uh, difficult to understand what it's trying to do. But here, maybe it is trying to um, identify groups of edges, or maybe corners, or small blobs. And uh, once it identified as, uh, in, when you go to high level features, maybe it's trying to, one because it now can recognize the corners and things, it, maybe it's trying to recognize the whole image itself, or, or whole object itself, or maybe moving edges. So these are different layers. Uh, and with each increasing, uh, layer, uh, the thing that it tries to identify, it becomes more abstract. And the assumption is, by the final layer, the abstraction will be across the whole image. And we'll try, uh, we assume that the network tries to understand some semantic content on the image. Now, uh, 
this is actually a very uh, big topic in itself, like visualizing the network and what it tries to see. Uh, so I'll go very briefly over this because we have lecture 12 coming up where this will be explained in great detail. So when you try to visualize a network, you have two options. Either you can see the weights or you can see the activations. So basically, you can see what the weights have turned to become, or you can see how the neurons are triggered when we give an input. Uh, in this particular example, we are looking at activations. So what this is doing is, uh, if we uh, remember the what the filter was doing, it was creating an activation map, a, a one-dimensional plate of size m by n. Now, given an input, we can see which of the particular neurons are being triggered. We do this over different inputs, and then we note down which neurons are getting triggered by which inputs. And then if we try to identify which uh, neurons were triggered maximum times, based on that, we can relate it back. So every, every neuron, uh, remember, is having its own receptive area in the original image. So whichever neuron is getting triggered maximum, we, we, we try to infer that the particular patch where that neuron was focusing had information which it wanted. So maybe if a particular neuron is looking for a, a very stark edge and it was there in that part of the image, then it is something that it wants and it gets. So uh, this is exactly what it's doing. So this is kind of a reception area in the original image where this, this particular neuron is trying to find. So maybe, maybe this particular neuron is trying to find a L-shaped corner and so on. So this is what you do when you visualize the uh, neurons in itself. The other thing which you can do, which is there in the future mm -hmm. slides, is uh, you can visualize the kernel. Now, as I said, the kernel is basically something similar to a template. So when the neural network or the convolutional neural network is trained, the kernels uh, learn to filter out some things. So maybe if it is trying to filter out uh, an edge, then the kernel in itself will look like an edge. Because when we are doing convolution, I, I told you that we are trying to do cross correlation. So we want the filter and that patch of the image to be similar. So if the filter is trying to figure out an edge, the filter in itself will look like an edge. Only then the cross correlation value will be high and will result in triggering a larger value in the corresponding neuron. So that is the visualization of the weights. And this is the visualization of the neurons. More details on this on lecture 12. So uh, here, what uh, we're trying to do is we're trying to relate this to our earlier findings. Uh, as you can remember, in the CAT experiment, we found the uh, complex cells and hyper-complex cells. Uh, so complex cells were res re responsive to stimulus like light, uh, light rays or slight movements, and hyper-complex cells were uh, more responsive to more uh, complex stimulus. of the positions in which these cells were organized in the cat's brain. So a similar analogy can be made in, uh, in, in the findings of this architecture, uh, CNN architecture, that the lower levels are trying to, are kind of acting like a uh, simple cell. The mid-level features are kind of acting like complex cells, and then the next one is acting like a hyper-complex cell. So this is kind of an analogy that we draw with uh, what uh, previous, like prior to deep learning, what people used to find. So this is what I was saying. Um, if you go focus on the top row, those are the visualizations of the filter. And uh, this whole uh, grayscale uh, grid of images are visualizations of the activation map. So I hope the difference is clear. So as I said, the filter will be, be, uh, filter will look like something which is trying trying to find. So here the filter has a shape of an oriented uh, edge. And as it slides over the image, it will try to find that kind of oriented edge. And whenever it does, it because of correlation, it will trigger some high values, which will look, and high values look more white. So whenever it finds similar uh, edges in the original image, it will trigger high uh, value in the output neurons. And the rest will be darker. I mean, the neuron didn't trigger. So the activation map looks like this. If you take a different uh, particular uh, filter, then maybe it's trying to find a uh, kind of a uh, uh, 
corner or a combination of uh, edges to make a kind of corner thing. And then whenever it sees a similar corner, it gives a high activation. So these are uh, some of the examples where visualizations on both the filters and the activation map is done. But uh, the problem is that we can only understand such things when the layer is, I think, the first layer or the second layer. If you move on to deeper layers, it's you know, impossible for us to comprehend what is happening. Uh, so uh, this is basically the equation of, the, of a convolution operation between two functions, uh, f and g, which are two-dimensional functions. And as you can see, uh, it's equivalent to the dot product of the corresponding uh, uh, points. But uh, here, it's actually the dot product of the flipped version corresponding points. But since our weights are untrained, it's basically equivalent to doing a dot product element-wise. Um, so finally, we have this example of uh, a neural network, uh, which is uh, doing a top five prediction in the ImageNet uh, uh, image. So this is the car. As I said, the initial uh, feature maps, activation maps, can be understood by humans because uh, they are the low-level features. So here, the features have learned to kind of try to identify the shape of the image. Uh, that is a car over here. But as we move on to deeper layers, we assume that it's trying to understand some semantic uh, understanding of the image, but it's difficult to comprehend what is actually going on. This is partially because um, if, you, if you think about it, the filter for this particular activation map the in input image is not the original image. It's the input image is basically the previous activation map. So it doesn't correlate uh, through our point of understanding to the car, because this is not the car. This is something else. And it's trying to learn something from this something else. So uh, it's difficult to understand this. There are different ways of uh, ways in which people have tried to understand what is going on. And that is also there in future classes. So there is this concept of deconvolutions and other, other, other stuff. Um, so uh, I think till now we have understood what a filter or a kernel is, how it operates on an image, and how it generates activation maps, how these activation maps, multiple activation maps are there per layer, and then how we stack them up together, and how when we train, it turns out that the filters uh, are similar to the previous experiments that were performed to be simpler in the lower uh, layers and com more complex in the later layers. Now, uh, uh, after this, we'll try to work out some examples where we ex explicitly calculate what kind of shapes these will be translated to, um, layer to layer. And then we'll try to draw some analogies to the brain. Uh, um, so that will be taken up by my friend Siddharth. Uh, but I think Prof wanted a small break because we, have, we don't have much slides remaining. Yes. We have a larger number of data that they learn different ways. Uh, as I see, it's like they should, on theory, learn the same way because I think they are at the same level and they are initialized randomly. Oh, because of brand, different random initialization, they learn different things. No, I think it's because. Uh, See, if you if you relate it to the simple neural network case, when it was just given one W matrix and it had lesser space, so when it was given a single W matrix, it was trying to find a template for each class. And as we can see, a single class cannot be represented by a single template. Template in the sense something which represents that class. So if you're trying to find uh, identify a horse, you cannot generate a simple template which has a horse looking to the left of the image. Maybe the, you will sometimes find a horse which is uh, 180 degree flipped, and so on and so forth. So a single class cannot be represented by a single template. That's the overall idea. Now, when you allow an architecture to have more space in terms of representation power, then automatically, uh, when it's trained, it 
exploits that representation, uh, that space to learn different combinations of uh, templates. So that's what happens over here is uh, when there is multiple features, uh, when one feature is identifying what an edge is properly, probably the other feature doesn't end up doing the same thing because now it has other things to do. Uh, how this happens, I think that's a mystery to all because we don't track how the weights are changed. I mean, in terms of uh, what it's doing, but it just ends up doing that. Uh, it learns different kinds of templates, every filter, so that it exploits the overall represent rep representation power of that particular class. Yes, sir. Um, so the combinational neural network can also be expressed within a ordinary neural network. So, however, the problem with that is that if you're going to have fully connected layers in every single hidden layer, then what's going to happen is that you're going to have too many hidden layers. And so, uh, for propagation as well as backward propagation, would take, take way too long. And it's simply not efficient for a computer to compute on such a huge scale. And so, um, over here in convolutional neural network, what we aim to do is just to scale down the hidden layers and uh, make them more segmented. So um, because it's like each of these sort of like uh, features such as horizontal lines or vertical lines, they are sort of like similar uh, across all dimension. It doesn't really matter if you're looking at a left and right picture or the uh, bottom right and right picture. A straight line is still going to be a straight line. And so what we do, what we're doing is basically just a series of convolution. Take a look uh, over there. Um, the beginning convolution layers, what they aim to do is just find these simple, uh, simple features like colors or straight lines. Uh, but then it's like it's through these combination of these simple features that is you can view it as some sort of a process of uh, detective doing. So with straight lines uh, and the slants, you're able to identify shapes such as eyes and more complex features such as mouth. And so if you're able to find an eye, find nose and find mouth, you'll be able to have a pretty good certainty to say that you know, what you're looking at in this picture is probably Days. And so, how these features develop? Um, yeah, like what Sid said previously, no one actually uh, really knows uh, how these things develop. But if you think about it from a statistical standpoint, if the algorithm is very good at classifying and identifying the bases, then uh, statistically, it's, uh, it's no uh, it's no surprise that it's also able to like find these advanced features such as eyes and mouths, which we were talking about. And has some uh, some sort of like uh, apparently human like capabilities, but all these are just by pure statistical and coincidence. Yeah. So basically, in putting in other terms, when whenever we have a neural network, we have random weights. So our objective, uh, so all those random weights can be arranged with different values. So different instances of those values creates the uh, hypothesis space. So all we're trying to do is finding a hypothesis, which for given an input maps to the correct output. That's what we're trying to do. And our iteration of a gradient descent or any back propagation tries to move in that hypo hy hy hypothesis space to find the correct hypothesis. So the thing is we never find the correct, but we approximate to, towards the correct hypothesis. Now what you're saying is if there are multiple filters, it is possible, yes, that all the filters learn the same thing. So that will be one such hypothesis. But it is also possible that it will not learn the same things and learn different things. Now, which hypothesis do you think will give better results? If it so, when you're training as convolutional neural networks, maybe maybe for hundred epochs. So it might be the case that in the twentieth epoch, all the filters that were in a particular layer was identifying the same thing. It gave some output. It had some loss. But then the network will know that we we can further improve this particular hypothesis to some somewhere else something else where we give more representation power to the filters and basically summarize more information per class. So that will lead to better results. So it's all about being able to move in the hypothesis phase to find that good hypothesis. So good hypothesis is something which turns out as humans do. So lower to higher and each filter has different uh, representations. So what you're saying is possible, but that won't give the optimal solution. Okay, I'm really sorry. It looks like our, our classroom uh, we had a misunderstanding and we're booked into another classroom downstairs. So there's a, a whole group waiting to take over.
this classroom. So we're going to vacate this classroom and go downstairs. Um, so we can take a, a five minute break. We are going to uh, Palm 1, <laughs> 103. That's the active learning classroom. There's two of them. That's why I got this thing. So we're going here. Uh, B. One zero three. So we'll be in ten minutes. My apologies for that.